Dr. Heather Vincent, welcome to the Science and Chill podcast. Thanks so much for joining me today. This is great. I'm really looking forward to it. Thanks, Brady. Yes, I'm looking forward to it as well. I have been looking forward to it uh, for a long time, and especially since our uh, meeting on on uh, Tuesday, where I did my my gait analysis. So, um, before we get started, can you just briefly introduce yourself and tell the audience a little bit about your education and career history, and then where you are currently working and some of your main roles and uh, sort of the hats that you wear currently? Sure. Uh, well, thanks for asking. Um, I'm currently serving right now as the director of the Sports Performance Center at the University of Florida. My second hat that I wear is also director of research. And so this is in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation in the College of Medicine. And it took me a number of years to get here. Um, trained at the University of Massachusetts as an undergraduate and then stayed there for my master's program in exercise physiology came down here to the University of Florida in the Department of Applied Physiology and Kinesiology. And uh, at that time, my advisor was Scott Powers and transitioned from doing animal work into humans. And so as we moved forward, my goal really was to take what we were learning at a very sophisticated level and bring the science to people. So over the years that followed, I did some teaching at Stetson University, did some research looking at exercise responses and adaptations did a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Virginia and then found our way back here. So currently we are in uh, my husband, Dr. Kevin Vincent, is actually the director of the Running Medicine Clinic. And so together we do a lot of the running science here. And it's one of my favorite parts of my job. So I've been very lucky that over the years, the stars aligned and uh, brought us back here. Awesome. Thanks you. Thank you for uh, sharing that. And I think that it, in terms of being in a place that is very great to have sort of a sports performance clinic like you do, Gainesville is probably definitely a great place. I can imagine not only do we have the sports teams here that you kind of maybe have access to, but generally a strong, you know, running community and endurance kind of community around here. Um, so is that something that you've, you know, also experienced just in terms of having this great community and being able to access all of these people? Um, do you think Gainesville is maybe unique in that respect? I'm sure there are other places around the, the country like that, but um, is Gainesville kind of particularly well suited? to have a running clinic like you do? You know, that, that's a great question. So when we came here in 2007, there wasn't anything like this. Uh, the Sports Performance Center was a little bit smaller and a little bit more focused on certain types of things. And one of the things that we brought with us here to UF was the interest and love in running medicine. And so in 2008, we started the process of creating a running clinic and developing specific services for that. As soon as we started that process, I couldn't believe the interest from the community. It was almost um, overwhelming and it excited us because it's something that drew people together. So we would participate a lot in the community events and show up to races and do the meet and greets and really get to know the community and what they were interested in. So it really was a true effort of getting to know who these people are, what they were looking for and how we could contribute to making their experience better. Yeah, that's great. And I can certainly attest to sort of you definitely making the experiences better just in and of my, you know, in and of itself for my own performance. You know, I have seen you a couple times for, for a gate analysis. And I guess I'll say, unfortunately, seeing your other half uh, multiple times due to various um, injuries. He has been great every single time, you know, uh, providing the providing the direction to get me rehabbed. But, you know, I every time I go and see him, I'm like, you know, I, I hate to have to see you again. It's nice to catch up, but I hope I don't have to yeah. come into your office, uh, you know, that often. But it's a great resource to have for all of the runners um, in Gainesville. And, you know, I did I posted something on Twitter just saying if you're in the area or not, you know, and have a chance to come in and visit and say hey to you and maybe get some testing done. It's a fabulous experience. Um, and on that note, you know, this Tuesday, I actually came in to, to the lab and did a gate analysis with you. This was my second time doing the gate analysis. It was always a fun time. Um, each time it was so much fun, just kind of nerding out. Um, so I want to go over kind of the general process of a gait analysis. I know you all do multiple types of performance testing, but in particular, I kind of want to just focus on gait analysis since we're going to be talking about running form a lot today. Um, so I came into the lab on, on Tuesday and went through the whole familiarization process, signed some forms, and then you all started hooking me up to a bunch of different types of equipment. I had all of these sensors on me, like uh, if anybody's ever seen when they're making a video game, the little dots on the people, that's sort of what I looked like on Tuesday. Um, so can you 
generally just go over the process of what you're looking at during a gait analysis, how everything works, um, how the camera system, the treadmills, and all of the markers work. I think people would be sure. very interested in learning about how that works. And then when we eventually, you know, play the videos, they can kind of understand what's going on during this gait analysis. Sure. So this is this is really a fun part of my job. But it's, it's taken us a good number of years to really get a handle on how to provide the best services for, for you as a runner. So the way that this works is initially we do like a history and an intake. So before we do anything, we listen to you. And I think that's really a key of a lot of successful data analysis is listening to the story. So if you have a nagging injury, something that won't heal, if it's catastrophic and it's a stress fracture or multiple fractures, um, if you're just there where you just wanna know is my form you know, healthy or not. And that's the word I'm going to use is do I have healthy form? It's not good or bad. We're going to talk about healthy. And so we do the history intake first, figure out what we want to target. And then we do a quick group of functional tests where I get a feel of what your body is doing even before I get you on the treadmill. And so I look at a little bit of your coordination and your strength, a little bit of the flexibility and balance. And then we get to the fun part where we get these special reflective sensors that are put all over your body. There's different types that are out there, but the, the model that we're using now is uh, basically we put these shiny markers all over specific bony landmarks and we create a computer model of you. Now there's lots of ways we can do that. And it's my goal over this next year to make the process even smoother. So moving away from markers and going into marker less. So you can feel more natural, whether you're on a treadmill or moving through a camera area. So right now we're using markers, but we're going to be transitioning. So stay tuned for some of the exciting evolutions of that. Yeah, very exciting. You were talking, yeah. telling me about that. I didn't find the markers to be too intrusive, but I'm oh, sure yeah. not having them on would be obviously a, an ideal scenario. Yeah, especially if they tend to pop off. Like if you're a, if you're a sweaty runner, <laughs> things <laughs> might not stick as well and they might right. come popping off. Or if you're really hard ground strikers, sometimes they pop off. So we just want to make your experience as comfortable, natural, without disruptions. And I think we can accomplish that. So once we get you on the treadmill, there's a couple of ways that I try and look at your motion. I want to look at what you like to do during a typical long run. So something that you could sustain, you know, for at least 30 minutes, 45 minutes or longer, like a long running pace. And then if you want to do something different, we typically do a speed that's a little bit higher or if you're doing intervals. So we like to look at a variety of conditions where your body is in that space. And the reason that more uh, speeds are helpful is that it, it's really good for us to be able to interpret the strategies that you're using when you change different speeds. And we can talk about what we found on yours in just a minute. So speed is also really important. So we just spend a few minutes, let you naturally do what you do, and then we collect films while you're on the treadmill and then also get a special motion capture with our infrared cameras. So the infrared cameras shine red light down on you, bounces off the shiny sensors and the cameras pick up that reflection and we can create this skeleton model of you. So it's a really fun way for the runner to visualize what it is that they're doing without having to be a biomechanist. And so not as a biomechanist myself, it's very important to be able to translate what you're looking at into something that's usable for the runner. And so that's the general process that we would use once we collect that information, we sort of make a collage of the videos and the skeleton itself and put it up on the screen and we debrief together with the runner. We also provide a customized report for you that gives you numbers. Some people are data driven, other people are visual driven. So we provide both and I, it's a little bit of an art to get a feel for what the runner wants and what they're responding to. So I try and relate to that as I'm, I'm working with each of you individually. Once we tell the story of what we find, what do we do with that information? So then we say, what are the deficits here that we think we can attack? What are ways we can tweak your form? And what are things we probably have to adjust with therapy and or shoe wear? So it really is the full stem to stern service of where are we? What can we do better? And how can we supplement your form with the things that will make you a stronger runner? I hope I yeah. explained that okay. No, that was a, a perfect explanation. And yes, the comprehensiveness, I was, I'm always uh, surprised. I'm not surprised, I guess, but rather pleased with the comprehensiveness of the, of their overall kind of exam, the explanation, and then sort of the prescription afterwards, because obviously that's the actionable steps that everyone is looking to do. And even during my gate analysis on Tuesday, we 
went through, you know, what are some of the strategies that I can use to improve my form, but then we actually implemented them and gave me feedback while I implemented those. So I got back on the treadmill, watched myself run, and then we sort of tried to, you know, put these into play and, you know, how does this feel? How does shortening your stride feel? You know, trying to prevent the crossover in the legs, for instance. So that part was super valuable. And then it's, you know, take this away and go home and, and practice. So definitely um, some actionable steps are, you know, were kind of my favorite part of the, the gait analysis. But no, your description was perfect. And with that being said, I definitely would like to, um, I think something that would be fun to do is sort of review my gait analysis and some of my videos um, from what we gathered on Tuesday. So I'm going to go ahead and pull that up. And I apologize, you know, to my to my listeners for this portion. Um, if you want to go and see the, the video, I will have that uh, uploaded onto YouTube and, and in the show notes, but we're going to go through some videos right now. So for those um, looking and for those who I guess are just listening, I have a file pulled up that has six different videos, um, six different angles, and then a couple different speeds, um, speeds being kind of slow motion versus regular motion of myself running. So I can probably uh, not describe it as well as Dr. Vincent could. So uh, Dr. Vincent, could you go ahead and maybe just uh, tell listeners and watchers what they're looking at right now with these six panels on the screen, um, what kind of views they're showing? All right. So uh, Brady, let me ask, do we have, uh, is the middle panel, is that your self-selected speed? And then the faster speed is on the right panel? Yes, I believe that's correct. Yep. So what I'd like to do for the, for the listeners and the viewers is I like to have the skeleton model up because it's a very stark contrast <clears throat> to the actual real-time video that we're looking at on the screen. So the views that we can get with cameras are complemented by the computer model of the skeleton. And sometimes when you see bones moving, it shows something uh, very clearly that might be a little bit trickier to pick out with the naked eye from a film. So the skeleton model that I look at, um, and I'm smiling as I look at the skeleton because I can very clearly see the couple of the things that we talked about. So my goal when I look at a gait analysis is to review the films for alignment. So how are your feet, your knees, your hips, and your shoulders all lined up? And is it looking linear up and down from the front? And then from the side, does your body have a nice overall slight forward lean to it as you're moving? And how are the feet placed on the ground relative to the hips? So I use the skeleton as kind of my go-to if I need that. But when I look at the high speed film, so let's take the side view down on the left hand corner. And uh, the side view is a nice place that I like to start just to get going because this is where most of the motion occurs in the running form from this point of view is from the side. So if this is what you've got at home and you've got a, a phone camera that you can use, this is a great place to get started. So what I'm looking for on the side here is the overall body alignment. If we have a nice little forward lean going, what are his feet doing when he lands on the ground relative to his pelvis? So here he's got a gorgeous, really long stride, but his feet are landing way out in front of his balance point, his center of mass or the hips. And so we might probably wanna shorten that up just a little bit if we can. Uh, what I do like is that after he makes contact with the ground, he flexes his knees very nicely. So I also look for soft landings. And knee bending is a good way to look at that. We don't want to hit the ground with a really straight leg with the heel out first. So if you film yourself and you see that, we want to make that correction and adjustment. Shorten up those steps a bit and make your knees bend a little bit, almost like you're softening your footfalls. I love how Brady is landing on the ground with his foot. He's making a beautiful foot contact that's off the heel and more from a mid to a four foot strike. And we can talk about foot strike in a little bit more if people have questions about that because I know that that can be confusing. But what I'm looking at is a combination of the technique that he's using to interact with the ground. Is it soft or not? I also look at going a little bit higher up the kinetic chain. Now I look at the pelvis and the hips. 
And from the side view, I just wanna make sure there's not excessive rocking or wrenching back and forth. We expect that there's gonna be a little bit of forward and backward motion, especially at the fast speeds that Brady's running at, but we don't want it to be so excessive that it's gonna be wrenching the spine or putting a lot of uh, stress on the hamstrings or the Achilles when you land on it. And then also from this point of view, I look at what the elbows are doing. Are they pulling back evenly? Do we have a nice even use of arms forward and backward? And where's the head position? So sometimes people over uh, compensate and lean way too far forward at the waist and bend. And that can get us into a little bit of trouble, contribute to knee pain and back pain, but also it can draw the head forward and then you start leading with the chin and the head. And that's also uncomfortable. So we just wanna make sure we have a nice contained uh, compact form from the side. So overall, there's a, there's a lot to like. I think we're just gonna work a little bit on stride length and making sure that uh, we're uh, take, taking a look here at um, what, what his arms are doing in terms of crossover as well. Yeah, the arm crossover, definitely one of the things that we, we had talked about uh, in depth for sure. <laughs> it, it's hard to see it from this side, but if you see the hands disappear from the side view and mm -hmm. kind of wrap around the front of the body, that's an indication we want to kind of get them moving a little bit more front to back instead of around and around like twisting. Yeah, and I think that one com becomes even more prevalent if we look at the kind of the back view. Mm -hmm. You can so, kind of see how far my, my wife... I was showing her my videos and she said it looked like I was running with chicken wings. So if anybody <laughs> needs, a, needs an analogy. <laughs> a little bit of the chicken wing going on. So now what I do is I look at the frontal view, which are the two panels in the middle. So I look at his body from the front and from the back. So just kind of opposite views and get a feel for what he's doing. And usually I just want to make sure that what I'm seeing from the back is the same I'm seeing from the front. Sometimes odd things can happen. But there's, a, I always start with the feet. And are the feet crossing over like he's running on a line? Or is he able to keep space between his feet so that he's almost running on the sides of a line? Or like down a, a, a strip on the road, the roadside paint line? If you can do that, that's good. So what I see when I look at Brady's form here is that the strides look enormous and gorgeous from the side. But as soon as I look at him from the front, because they are enormous, He's reaching way out in front of his body and the feet are crossing over. And now what that's going to do is create a lot of stress that can happen at the ankles, especially at the knees, and potentially at the back and the hip, depending on what other motion is going on here. So we want to widen the stance a little bit, and we can very clearly see that also from the back view as well. Now let's go a little bit higher up to the knees. Uh, what's interesting is that his knees, when he's not standing at rest, he does not have like a bow out leg appearance. But when he's running, he gets this very interesting knees out to the side appearance, which is meaning he's changing his mechanics when he's running. So now that means I have to look a little higher up toward the hip and the pelvis about what's causing that lack of control. And so when we looked at what he's doing at the hips and the pelvis, that's his anchor point. I wanna make sure around the anchor point of that pelvis that we're not having a lot of up and down or rotation happening here. And when I look from the back view at his pelvis, I'm seeing some asymmetric up and down going on here. Part of that is because his steps are so large. The other part is he's also rotating his pelvis to get that extra reach. So what we need to do to correct a lot of these things from the hip down is shorten up the step length and really activate muscles around the hips and the pelvis. And so maybe Brady, I can ask you once you gave that a try, what did that feel like to you? Yeah, so when we practiced these afterwards and I shortened my stride length, it felt, as you kind of said it would, it felt very awkward at first because, you know, I told you it, it almost felt like I was running kind of with a stick up my butt because I was trying <laughs> to activate my, my hips and my glute muscles as well as, you know, like you said, sort of run as I was sort of straddling a line and shorten my strides up. Um, so it, it felt awkward, but I did mention to you that how how much less stressful it felt just on my feet and sort of on my hips. I felt kind of the the weight and the activation shift towards more kind of the posterior side of yes. um, 
of my body and, you know, activating those glutes a little bit more. So it felt great after more practice, I'm sure it will feel much better versus, you know, just um, trying to change your form up on the spot um, where, you know, you got to get over the initial awkwardness. But no, I definitely just by that small change of kind of activating consciously, trying to activate my glutes and shortening the steps, I felt massive changes in terms of how I was able to prevent my feet from crossing and, and things like that. So I definitely noticed it was a certainly noticeable. Good. And that, and that's what he's describing to the listeners is absolutely normal. It will feel weird. It feels strange to do something different. If you imagine if all of you runners out there, you've been doing a certain pattern for a long time. So your brain has this wired in pattern of what you feel like you should be doing and what your normal is. So when you make adjustments and we'll look at the next videos here on the right hand side in a minute, what Brady used was a combination of watching video by feeling and getting feedback from testers to try and see if we could make small adjustments to it, allowing his muscles to do the work of dampening the force impact that he really had. So we did a before and after report to show the kinds of improvements that he was making. And these take time. It's You can make adjustments in one session, but you get better and better and better with more and more practice. So with a lot of the research out there waivers anywhere from one practice session out to eight. And you get better and better with adopting the form the more times you do it and the more feedback you have. So I know that that might be difficult for people who are coming from a distance or from out of state, which is why I recommend using the phone at home or have somebody film you from front and back and give you feedback as you're going just to make sure you're kind of hitting those cues like you want to. And then Dr. Vincent, if, sorry to interrupt, if somebody wanted to kind of implement some of these suggestions, you know, I was mentioning to you how I don't think I want to go on an entire, say, you know, six, seven, eight mile run while I'm focusing on all of these cues. But what would yeah. you suggest would be the easiest way for somebody to, say, implement, you know, maybe just focusing on stride length or just focusing on activating some of the different muscles? You know, if they wanted to do that at sporadically during their run, maybe in one or two minute intervals, what would be the best way to do that? Sure. And so I'm going to actually rephrase what you said and say what might be the healthiest way to do it, because there's uh, the word best, I think, always makes people um, get driven toward a yes or a no answer or kind of uh, one pathway only. And what I think the science is actually showing us is that there's a couple ways to achieve this. You can either do if you're not willing to cut down your volume on running, but you want to move in that direction of making these changes insert intervals of doing this. For example, maybe two to three minutes at most at a time of interspersing a really concerted effort on making these changes. So let's say you go out for a 30 minute run. You might start with that warm up, then fully engage in two minutes of focus, maybe fall back into your other pattern and then two minutes and then two minutes and break it up. So that way you're not so exhausted at the end of the run mentally or physically that you feel like, you know what, I don't wanna do this allow the body to adapt. And this is gonna be key. If you went cold turkey and said, I'm gonna switch everything that I'm doing and all of a sudden change over to that, you might get discouraged and feel tired and think this isn't as enjoyable as, as I thought it was gonna be. So you can do intervals and over time lengthen those intervals until you've got a natural feel. Or if you cut down the volume completely, you can start with a shorter distance overall and just use this new form. So there's different ways that you can do it. It just depends on what your readiness is and if you're recovering from in injury when your distance is already low or if you're feeling pretty good but you just want to make change, try the intervals. Those might be some options for you. Perfect, perfect. And you're totally right in that it, it's so mentally taxing almost versus the physical, you know, it takes obviously some some effort to sort of in, in, uh, integrate these cues, but the mental focus that it just takes to, to focus on all of these things at once, because I was trying to focus on glutes, shorter stri stride length, arms, you know, going up and down versus sort of side to side. So all of those things at once sort of can be a, a little bit of the mental overload. So you're going to finish a run feeling uh, super tired, probably mentally and physically. Right. And we don't want that. We don't want you to get discouraged. Sure. So, you know, listen to your body. The other thing you can do as well, you can also insert in little walk breaks. So for people who are doing this as well, look, take the walk breaks. And the reason I'm bringing this up is this is something now we've done for a few years, whether you're a 15 year old runner or you're a 70 year old runner and you're making these changes, just insert that in a little bit one or two minutes, just recoup, shake it out a little bit, 
mentally refocus and then re-engage. And it can just make it feel a little bit more tolerable as you go. Um, so that's also another strategy that, that you could try. Awesome. Those are all great. And so I think that, um, I think these two videos I have on the right may be just the same, um, just my slower motion. Um, so I don't know if they're necessarily the any different. So we might not need to discuss any extras on them unless there was anything else that we kind of had discussed that you forgot and maybe you want to chat before we kind of go into my report card. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe the one thing I do want to mention here is for the listeners who, who can't see this as well, the last thing that I looked for when I was watching Brady adjust his form is that he had a lot of back and forth lat, um, kind of wobbling motion on his upper body. So he was really using his trunk side to side to really get a lot of step length. And while trunk motion can be helpful, too much side to side actually can work against you because now your legs cross over in opposition to fight what your trunk is doing. So what I try and do is when I see a pattern, I try and help a person think of a movement pattern where it feels more natural, gentler, and softer, and you're not fighting yourself as much, and you're working more safely. And so as we talk about your report going forward and sort of the recueing that, actually, do you want to do the report first and then what we talked about with the recueing? Yeah, sure. Why don't we go ahead and do that? And then so before I go to that, I will just mention if anybody's watching and one of the main things that you pointed out to me that has become so prevalent now is that if you're looking at the back view of me running, so from the back, you were talking about my trunk moving side to side and how hard my lower back muscles are working. Um, my, my anatomy education is failing me, so I'm not quite sure what that muscle is. But when I take my left and my right stride, you can see the muscle prominently sort of just pop out on each yeah. uh, on each stride. So that just it was something that you showed me where I was like, oh, wow, you know, my you asked me if I had lower back pain and I told you no, but um, you were kind of surprised just due yeah. to the fact that those things look like they're working so hard during my stride. Yeah, uh, he wins the award for the most uh, for, uh, the most profound activation of his back muscles. You could really see the striations in there. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take what I can get. <laughs> All right. So I will now, let's see, move on to my report card. Let's see here. Okay. So, um, and as, as we mentioned, so after they give, we provide all the videos and we went over that, then Dr. Vincent, during my analysis, gave me a report card. So we have three pages and there are a bunch of all these different parameters. And so we can discuss maybe some of the primary parameters of interest here. We obviously don't have to go into this super in depth, but what um, on this first page here, we looked at things like uh, center of gravity, cadence, and things like that. What were some maybe noticeable things here? And then why might those be important just in general for people to, to focus on? Yes. So uh, the reason we designed this report the way we did is that over the years, we've incorporated the emerging science this report now is not the same as it was three years ago, as it was six years ago. We keep evolving it based on what the science is telling us and what we're learning. So this first page for us really is extremely important because they're very, very powerful measures. And that when you change any one of them in a good way, you can really change the entire rest of the report. And so a couple of the big ones on here that I pay really close attention to that you can very quickly change at home anytime include cadence, how many steps you're taking a minute, your vertical displacement, so it's a real fancy way of saying how much do you bounce. So we track that about where your belly button is. So how much does it bounce up and down every time you take a step? And then we look at your step lengths and your stride width. So your step lengths, I look at symmetry. I wanna make sure that your body, just like walking and running, it should be your left and your right sides really should be doing the same thing. If everything's assuming everything is working correctly and that there's no weird issues with, with uh, leg lengths or anything like that. So let's assume everything is anatomically aligned and correct for looking for symmetry. So when I scan down this page very quickly, I can see that uh, Brady's cadence naturally, is this your natural one, your first one? This is actually my faster speed. So yeah. my natural, my first one where we were about seven and a half miles per hour, I think my cadence was 171. And now okay. it's, yeah, 173 here. This was the faster speed. Got it. So mm -hmm. this is also a, something I want to bring up as well. So at this faster speed, this is a really good clip here. So compared to many of the runners that we have had doing their typical testing, the speed is a little bit faster than um, most of our other runners. So I do want to point that out. So his cadence is actually um, in, a, in a decent place. 
It's 173, and I get a lot of questions about cadence, and I saw that there was one from um, an interested listener about, yes. Is, there, yes, is there truth about the 170 to 180, should that be the ideal? So I'm going to rephrase that and say, there is no such thing as an ideal. What we try and shoot for, what's going to give you healthy running motion and low impact forces? What's going to help you try and get your mechanics as safe as possible? Now, does that mean that's the same for a tall person, a short person, a heavy person, and so on? The answer is generally yes. So when you comb through the data, even when people do cadence retraining, most people can get their cadence above 170 and make really good, healthy changes. Now, if you can get it to 166 and you look great, fine, I'll take it. And it feels good to you, and that's what you can maintain for 10 miles, fantastic. If there's ever room to get that up a little bit more, great, it's not going to hurt you. So just understand that the faster we can try and get it somewhere at least up to 170, that's that's pretty darn good. So I'll have to I'll have to pull up some of my older reports, but I think you know based on what I was doing maybe five or six years ago, I think I've considerably increased my cadence probably think, by seven or eight uh, yeah. steps per minute probably. Yeah, I, I think you have. If I remember that too. So even at his comfortable pace, he was going 171, and that's and that's great. But if, you, if you, we look at the speed change from 171 to 173, here's where the issue about speed comes from. We know that your step lengths are going to increase a bit with faster speed. That's normal. It will. We just want to make sure that you're also trying to move your feet faster. So your cadence should go up a little bit. That's what we're hoping for. If your only way of changing your speed is to make your steps longer, we got to change that up because that's where we tend to see injuries take place if we really strain by trying to overreach. Let's work on also getting your feet moving a little bit faster as well. So we want both to increase, not just the length alone. Got it. So faster steps, longer stride yeah. combined is the best way to increase yeah. your speed or get yeah. faster, go faster. Yeah. For, at least for what we know now. Right. Now, now let's go forward to step lengths. Right now he's got step lengths that are about 1.3 meters. His left side is taking a little bit longer step than his right. So I just kind of keep that in the back of my mind and see if this is something we need to be concerned about or not. His stride width is extremely narrow. It's only about four centimeters and that didn't change from his first speed. Now, what you can't see for the people who aren't, who aren't able to see the videos is that this is a little bit of a misnomer. And so I, this is where I use the videos in addition to the number to make sense of it. We want that stride to be wider. There is no ideal. So again, I'm putting that context out there, but for him, because he's crossing over, he has no stride width. He was using his lower body like a pendulum and we've got to get his feet more parallel and with parallel feet comes wider stride width. It all works together. How do we do that? We increase our cadence, we take softer steps and we activate our gluteal muscles. So the cues for Brady are all gonna to work toward making a healthier pattern with the same message here. So those are really the big things that I look at on this sheet. He's got a really good, I would say a pretty good stance time where he gets his feet up off the ground pretty pretty quickly. I'm not worried about that, that looks good. Yeah, and I don't have my, my slower speed here, but I think my uh, step length was somewhere around maybe like 1.15, 1.2-ish or something, but it was definitely shorter. So as you were describing earlier, I certainly just seem to increase my speed or when I run at a faster speed, do it all through increasing my stride length. So that's something to, to work on. Yeah. All right, so let's go on. Uh, we're on page two now of this report. So here we have um, some ground reaction force data. So what are, we, what are we looking at here, Dr. Vincent? Sure. So I, I know there's a lot of numbers on this page and we put this on here for the people who are data lovers and like to track what they're doing. So we give you the real numbers, but then we also give you context of the so what. So the first column of information that we have here relates to really what are the actual units of force you're hitting the ground. And then we convert it over to body weights, which is more relatable to people. And it gives us a sense of really what's going on here. From those numbers, we can compare you to people in your same age group, sex and foot strike type. So it gives you an idea of how you relate to others who are not injured that have very nice running form. So on this page, um, really what I, I pay attention to are how high are the peak forces when you're fully loaded on the ground? And that's usually during a mid stance. So when you're on one leg and you really put all your body weight on, 
is that symmetrical between the right and the left? And we hope it is. We want you to be loading equally. And for him, he is. So that looks really good, around 2.8 body weights. At faster speeds, we expect this number to go up. That's normal and natural. So this looks great. Now, how we get to that peak force is very important to me because this impact loading rate is one of our risk factors that we know now for different types of injuries, including stress fracture, back pain, medial stress reactions, fibular uh, stress reactions, and so on, metatarsal. So what I look at is how, how the shape of these ground reaction force curves appear on this paper. The steeper this curve or the sharper the curve, the faster he's loading on the ground. And we don't want fast loading because that means he's really breaking really, really hard. We want him to use the ground like he's using it to sort of float off of. Just use it to get yourself back up in the air really quickly. And that's a hard thing to think about when you're running. So the cue that we give a lot of people to help address this, so for Brady in this case, he's hitting the ground on the left side of with about 77 body weights a second, and on the right side about 54, somewhere in there. When we translate that over to our comparatives, he's on that upper range of impact forces. Part of that comes with speed. The other part comes with step length, where his foot is landing out in front of him, and the fact that he wasn't really activating his gluteal muscles and his hamstrings and the muscles he needs to cushion or soften those footfalls. And so part of the cueing is to address this page right here to say, land softly or lift your feet off the ground a little quicker. There's different ways runners can visualize how you, uh, visualize how you do that. So this is where some of the retraining comes in to help encourage people to find the cue that works for them to land softly. I think the best thing that you told me to work on here with the softer landing was to focus not on the downward push, but rather on lifting your knees when you run instead. So I also try to do that when I'm on like the stationary cycle, instead of sort of mash down on the pedals, pull yeah. up on the pedals and that you kind of get the, the posterior chain activation, but then you do yes. take a lot lighter steps for sure. Yes. And thank you for bringing that up because the lifting from the knee a little bit, I, it doesn't have to be dramatic. And I don't necessarily want people, you know, prancing around. And I know that that's what people feel like is they feel like they're prancing. But really what you're doing is you are sort of pre-activating and preparing your leg muscles for absorbing the impact when you hit the ground. You're just waking them up instead of sort of passively hitting the ground. So it's just getting your body to think about how do I prepare myself for interacting with the ground a little bit better. That, that's our goal. All right, and then I'll just go to page three here. We can kind of discuss maybe just some of the final things. A very heavy data heavy slide again, but maybe we can just uh, focus on some of the, the key panels and maybe some of the more sure. things that you find most to be the most important. Sure, so the last page that we see on here, uh, otherwise we'd end up with a 25 page report for those who love the data. <laughs> but really what I tried to create here was a panel or a screenshot, an overview of all the motion that your ankles, knees, hips and pelvis are doing during a typical gait cycle. The one part that I would probably revise at this point is getting the trunk and the arms on here because the trunk and the arms can drive some of the motion that we're seeing on this page. So just know that those changes are probably coming in the near future. But what we have here is during a typical gait cycle from foot contact to loading, push off, swing, and all the way back down to foot contact again, what is your body doing? And how does your motion look? Is it symmetrical between the right and the left side, which on, this, on these pictures are the colored lines? That's Brady. So his right uh, side is in red and his left side is in green. The colors only mean left and right. And because there's only one pelvis segment, there's only one line on the bottom pictures on the bottom of the panel here. So we're simply tracking the markers associated with each of the joints during the gait cycle. And if it's symmetrical, the colored lines are going to overlap. That's what we're hoping for. So symmetrical motion in a good way. The gray bars, the comparisons, are the expected motion that we might see from other healthy runners that don't have injury in the same comparative group. Now, if there's a speed differential between these, we understand. And there's context when we do interpretations here. So what I really use this for is symmetry and where we're really deviating. So very quickly, you can scan down. If we look at the left side first, that's the side view. 
So this is where most of the motion is coming from. And overall, I really like what I see. There's a lot of symmetry here, and I really didn't have too many comments on this at all. I think he does a great job with getting his all of his joints moving in exactly the pattern that we would expect. So very nicely done from this point of view. Now, when we shift to the front, this is where a couple of the things that we could see with the naked eye also appear on the screen. So for those who can see the pictures, the very top middle picture of the ankle is showing something a bit odd. And what we recognize this as is an indication of the foot crossover. So this has nothing to do with him, you know, purposely putting his feet in a, a pronated position or in a supinated position. This is happening because he's crossing his feet over so far, the computer is sensing it as something not right. So once we make those corrections, that those lines drop down into the area where it's gray. That's the idea. If we go a little bit further, the other thing that we uh, also notice here is the pelvic motion. So here overall at foot contact, right when he loads on the ground, things look great. As we get toward the point where he's pushing off and really driving, this is where we have some things changing here and we have hip drop or hips, uh, the knees drawing in toward the midline. So again, it's just affirmation that what we're seeing with our naked eye is actually creating something mechanical here. So for him, this all comes down to foot crossover and long stride length. That's how we're seeing that. And then finally, if we look top down, so this is the, the panel over here on the right hand side. Again, we see variations here that are associated with the foot placement. He had more exaggerated leg movement in, if I can remember on the left hand side. Is that true, Brady, if I can remember? Yes, correct, okay. yep. Um, and so uh, what can happen is that there's compensation a little bit on the right side. When I interpret that and then I look down toward the pelvis, I also see that something happening here where he's using the right side of the pelvis to keep driving forward. So he's asymmetric at the pelvis as well. And you could also see that from uh, uh, basically the videos as well if you're tuned in to, to knowing what to look for. So how would I interpret this? We just have way too much motion occurring around the hips and the pelvis that we need to control. The cues are gonna be the same, but for him, this is how they're appearing on this report. So if we step further, do you want me to talk about the cues, Brady, how we interpret this? Um, yeah, sure, let's go ahead and do that. And then we can yeah, wrap up this section, but yeah, I'd love to talk about that. Okay, so when I take this whole story from the first page of the temporal spatial, the really powerful metrics, to the ground reaction forces, to the motion, what we realize is that we need to have Brady work on trunk control, so less side to side and more anchoring the pelvis a bit. We need to really focus on activating the gluteals, taking shorter steps and really working on parallel feet and softer landings. It sounds like a lot. I'm gonna boil this down to a couple main things to start with because as a runner, you might say, oh my God, this, there's no way I can focus on that. I understand. And that's probably not realistic to expect that in the very first session either. So in a piece that we just finished writing for ACSM yesterday to complement the healthy habits, we encourage runners to think about focusing on the big cues first and then worry about the little cues. So the big cues that are gonna really be hard hitting for Brady are going to be the cadence and the landing softly. The third cue we're gonna work on for him, once he feels pretty good about adjusting that, is really working on the truncal control. And the reason I'm using that approach with him is that so many good things already happened just with the first two, that's great. So work on the first two that you can get a lot of um, benefit from those first and then continue to modify your form over time. So if there's too many cues to work on at first, let's do the big ones and then continue over the weeks that follow to keep adjusting and use feedback with the phone or having a partner take video of you to see if you're accomplishing that. So that's the approach that I would use with him.
Yeah. And like I told you, I'm very excited to, I was almost excited the same day to get on the treadmill and practice those, but I'll wait, a, I'll wait a couple of days before I begin. But all three of those cues, again, practicing them in the lab was super helpful. And yeah, um, I, I found them super helpful and very, the immediate feedback was astounding as well. So I think that anybody who implements whether the cues we talked about now or maybe the cues we'll talk about for healthy distance running habits in a second. Um, they're very easy to implement. Even if you just do a couple at a time, you can really see see the um, the immediate feedback. So again, I, I appreciate you going over my gate analysis again, but um, I, hopefully people find that interesting as well as you know the, the visual component of it, I think will be very interesting for, for all listeners. Um, so now I kind of want to transition. You mentioned that you all had published a an infographic on healthy habits for distance running um, and presented this recently, I guess, at the ACSM conference. So I'd love to discuss the infographic. That will be in the show notes, too, for, for people who are interested in, in looking at that as we discuss it. Um, so can you talk about uh, this infographic and maybe where the data for it came from? And then let's go over just some of the awesome cues. And I'm looking at the infographic right now, um, just some of the great cues that can be provided to runners or that runners can focus on to, I won't say, you know, run with the best form, because you said you don't, you know, like that word, but you know, the best form for them, maybe, or the most ideal form for right. whatever type, type of runner they are. Sure. So what, I, what I'll do is I will uh, preface this for the listeners is that one of my roles on the American College of Sports Medicine is I chair the committee on, on consumer outreach. And so what that means is I try and make the science digestible, usable, as factual as we can make it for the public and for public use. So it's very important to me. One of the things I've really enjoyed about this position is taking what we know and helping people uh, make healthy decisions about the uh, techniques that they engage in, engage in the um, processes that they do, do products that they buy. What is it based on and how do we go from there? So the impetus for this infographic was really based on our love of what we do and that there's such a huge interest scientifically about running science, but also from the public. People from you know, elementary school are already gauge, engaging in running and our oldest runner is 85 years of age and they're still competing. And so this is just fabulous that this is a sport that people can do for a lifetime. So what can we do to help people uptake habits that are less likely to injure you over time? And so um, this took a lot of going back through the literature, and this now goes back through a couple of decades, really about understanding running from the basic, mechanically, how does a human run? And what are the normal strategies? What, what do we look for? And then the science developed into getting therapists involved. So there's some fantastic work from Irene Davis's group, um, Mike Fredrickson's group, Brian Heiderscheidt's group, um, so they brought in the medical part and the therapy part and really started looking at techniques to help keep um, runners either rehabilitated, safe, and back out there and being injury free. So I credit them with doing a lot of this foundational work. And it's hard to be a pioneer. So I just want to make sure that the listeners know that this takes a long time to, to do this work. We, over the last decade, have also embarked on a variety of different studies to understand running motion um, through different conditions, whether it's holding hydration gear, running downhill, um, involving people that have different body masses or ages. So not just the collegiate healthy runner. We wanted to make this generalizable for people of all different um, experiences and backgrounds. So that's where the science is coming from. From that, what can we distill down and say, okay, what appears to be patterns? So I encourage people to look at data in the context of patterns. Um, don't just take what your word for it from one source, read a few, and then look for patterns. Because you might find things from one paper that look really, really neat, but don't necessarily apply to others. So what I've tried to do is be very careful and purposeful about the things that we put on this infographic by looking at things that have consistently emerged over time as potentially being helpful. So that's where this came from. And so uh, when this was recently released out to the, the public this past spring, um, overall there was really nice uh, support for it. And then there's some that um, either disagreed or uh, basically had some thoughts on skill acquisition 
And maybe this isn't necessarily something people can use right away. And so part of what we did is again, put context why this was developed. So we just gave this to our, uh, to the leadership yesterday. If you're gonna be posting that commensurate with the infographic on the ACSM website. So should you like to read it, it's there going through each of the cues and where the, where the numbers came from and why. Um, but also understand that these are supposed to be helpful. And maybe this is not a one size fits all, maybe there are the exceptions. So please understand that when, when you look at that, we're trying to hit the general health of the runner that comes in. How do we keep them out of the doctor's office and not in Dr. Kevin's office? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And yeah, I'll definitely include a, a link to, um, you know, even if you have to provide that yeah. to me later on, a link to that in the show notes. But I think that is important to say before we go over these cues that, Yes, obviously, nobody's going to be able to emulate all of these cues perfectly. Maybe maybe Eliud Kipchoge, but even I'm sure he does, has a few of flaws in his stride. But um, yeah, I mean, it's important to note because, again, I think people could somewhat be discouraged if they look at this infographic and think, oh, I don't look at all like that when I run. What's the point of trying to maybe practice? So I think even if you're able to maybe work on a few of these skills, they can significantly improve your running, not only your performance, but also kind of longevity, for sure. Yes. And just also understand that there's also science to show that even when you work on a couple of them together, your learning might actually be improved and you can make even better change, uh, better um, healthy changes on terms of impact and motion. So it will take some time. It does take some learning. We acknowledge that. Um, but these are at least some things to get started and some maybe targets to shoot for. Great. Okay, cool. Yeah, but we can just briefly uh, maybe go over some. That would be awesome. Sure. So... Uh, I don't have it in front of me, but I will remember this. I can actually, um, I can pull it up on the screen. I have oh, it. Great. I, okay. Yeah. So that way, at least if you can see it, uh, that might be helpful. And then for the other uh, viewers, we can direct you to uh, ACSM website. Or if you want to, you can share it, Brady. Yes, <clears> for sure. So yeah, let me let me pull that up. I think that'll be great for everyone to to see that as well. So I came I came prepared. Thank you so much. <laughs> with all of the relevant slides. Okay, great. All right, here we go. Thank you so much. All right, so one of the things uh, I want you to look at is that we're looking at a movement pattern. And we chose this image because this is the highest point of loading that your body is going to experience when you're running. This is all weight on one foot. How well can we control that motion over thousands and thousands of steps during a typical run? So some things we wanna be looking for are uh, including linear arm swing. So rather than having arms that cross the, the front of the body across the midline, maybe some of you experience that when you're tired, you start falling into the using the trunk more and really swinging the arms. That means we're starting to lose muscle control of things that are happening lower down or more proximal. So on the hips, the glutes, your body's getting tired. <clears throat> Uh, if we look at the squeeze the gluteal muscles or the buttocks, this is a hard cue to do, but really what we mean by that is just contract those muscles. And it's going to feel a little bit strange, but when you fire up those muscles, it can help with controlling the motion of the hips and therefore further down the knees and the ankles. It widens the stance a little bit, helps control pelvic drop, and keeps your knees in a more healthy position instead of rotating in or dropping in toward valgus. You may have heard that term as well. One of the ways also we can accomplish this is through a fast foot turnover or cadence. You can use either term. We're aiming for 170 steps a minute or, or higher. Now there's going to come a point, of course, of diminish, law of diminishing returns. You're going to get to a point where your steps are so fast you start to lose speed and you're going to be doing more jump roping. And you know, that's, that's okay if that's what you want to do, but really we want to find that happy medium where you can still maintain a nice uh, pace that you want to do, just get your feet moving faster. Our goal is also to rapidly bring your feet around or pull your foot in more toward you rather quickly so your feet land more under your hips. And that's what this picture was trying to show for you here of what that might look like. It may never be perfect, but let's strive to get that foot closer to under those hips as well. Shorter steps also mean less bounce. So you're kind of killing two birds with one stone here as well. When we look at the position of the head, there are different cues that may work. And so we've tried a variety over the past decade, 12 years, and there's some good papers to show that you can try and teach people a little bit of forward lean or anterior lean, whatever term you wanna use, but sometimes people misinterpret that and they start bending at the waist. 
and that causes other problems. So we don't want that. What, what cue might help the excessive forward lean but get your body into a nice position is maybe tuck the chin up a little bit or pull a string through the spine or through the top of the head so it draws your body up. They're doing the same thing. So the visualization might work differently for anybody, but the goal is going to be the same of excessive forward lean. We want to avoid that at the waist. I've also heard maybe some cues in terms of where to look in front of you. Um, could those be maybe used as another cue? Like I know, you know, if you're obviously looking straight down on the ground, that's probably not good. Is there like maybe a, a certain distance that might help if people want to use that as a cue or is that maybe not as evidence-based as this yeah, chin, chin you know, tucking technique? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I'm not aware of uh, the, the visualization part, except for the head down. I have seen that put into practice. I have not seen really publications on that. And the tuck the chin, just so that people know, is that is not a published cue per se. This is something to avoid the position, something to get you in the right position. So I uh, just kind of understand that that's, that kind of works together as well. Uh, the, the pointing the kneecaps forward is a published cue. And that kind of goes together with the squeeze the gluteal muscles. You're really trying to open up the knees and widen the stance a little bit. So uh, some people respond really well to that cue, but what we're trying to prevent is the knee dive and the knee collapse and getting the feet to just open up a little bit as well. So that might work for some of you, but we don't want knees bumping. We don't want them grinding against each other. And for those runners that have knee bruises or know that you know either your ankles scuff or you have holes in your, your shorts or your leggings because your knees are grinding, we gotta get those kneecaps pointing forward and really work on the gluteal strength. Other cues that might help are short, quick steps, which you can benefit from some knee lift, decreasing the foot cross over here, and it really softens impact uh, forces on the joints. And landing softly is an excellent way to do that. So this is well published. And I do wanna credit uh, Dr. Davis's group with starting to really work on those cues. And they've had a lot of success with, with doing that in case series, in interventional studies, and so on, and others have taken that forward, even taking it to the military. So this is nice to see that if landing softly works for you, then that means you're using the right muscles to start softening those steps. You're gonna start using your gluteal muscles, your hamstrings, your calf muscles. So all of these work together to create a pattern of motion that is really, I think, gonna be protective against injury. So hopefully yeah, that explains that a little bit better. Oh yeah, no doubt. I think the explanation mm -hmm. the explanation was perfect. And then at the bottom there, are just a couple a couple more habits um, that, or I guess rather suggestions on how to implement these. Just suggesting take a break and walk for a minute or two. We kind of already discussed that. You know, what's the best way to do this? Maybe you go one to two minutes on, a couple minutes off to make sure you're rested, so that each time you start and try to integrate these cues, you're not fatigued mentally or physically. Um, and then obviously caveat, you know, don't outrun your endurance capacity, sort of <laughs> build your way up into all of these. Something runners are not typically good at, you know, we don't <laughs> like to, we don't like to uh, limit ourselves often. So we kind of like to jump right into things and go full, full force from the, from the start, but, you know, to avoid injury and to really optimize, I think running form slower is better, but something I'm continuous, continually learning as well. <laughs> Very good. Oh. All right. So cool. I appreciate you um, describing that. Again, I think that, you know, whether you're watching um, or listening, you can take a look at this infographic on your own time or during the podcast. And um, I found it super helpful. And just to have an image, I think, of whether it's yourself running, whether you video yourself and see yourself running or looking at this infographic and trying to replicate that during a run, I find that to be super helpful. Um, something that I used to do, I find it kind of funny, but something I used to do when I was a younger runner, I would always watch runners on TV and the Olympics or like at track meets and I would see somebody with like a beautiful form. So one of my favorite runners used to be a guy named Bernard Legat and I always just watched him run and I'm like, oh my gosh, he has the best running form. So I'd go out on my runs and try to run like he did. So, you know, obviously it's a little bit, you think you look like them. And then when you probably look at a video of yourself, you don't quite look like them, but, <laughs> um, but it's always, you know, fun, nice to have a visual representation of what you want to do while running. Um, and I think that that'll help people to, to kind of uh, implement some of these, these things that we talked about today. So thank you so much for, for going over that. Um, and now I just have a kind of a final few topics that I would like to um, discuss. I definitely want to get to a few listener uh, Q and A's um, because I think we had some 
pretty decent, a decent amount of interest on Twitter, actually. I think you were one of the more popular listener Q&A oh. uh, <laughs> uh, guests everybody. on the podcast. Yeah, so uh, I definitely want to get to those. Do you have about 15 more minutes where we can yes. maybe talk yes. about running shoes and then get to the listener Q&A? Yes. Okay, cool. Definitely wanted to talk about running shoes because when it comes to running, I think this is one of the more popular topics. Everybody's always thinking, what type of running shoes should I get? People are always asking me on Twitter, what do you think about these shoes? And I'm just like, I, I really don't know. I'm not a biomechanics expert. I'm not selling a type of shoe. And in general, I try to just tell people, you know, if it feels comfortable, it's probably, you know, a decent shoe. Um, and that's not the greatest advice, but it's kind of the best that I want to give. The last thing I want to do is, t- uh, you know, recommend a shoe to somebody and then they get hurt and, you know, come right. after me. So, Selecting the right running shoes. What are some of your top recommendations on, you know, selecting the right shoes? If somebody is thinking about whether they're a runner or taking up running and want to get a good pair of shoes for them that are going to help prevent injury, that are going to be comfortable, what do you suggest uh, are some of the best steps to select the best running shoes? Sure. And that, that's, that's actually a, a great question. And again, I'm going to use the word best for uh, what is going to promote the healthier uh, foot motion. And how does that translate up going going up the body? So uh, um, this is probably going to be an unpopular statement, but uh, Mm -hmm. shoe companies don't make money if they don't sell shoes. And so each year there's going to be a new variety of things out there, new adjustments, new tricks of the trade, new gimmicks, whatever they might be. What I try and look for are what is still going to keep the foot in a natural position. So basically, When you land, what's going to get your heel down to the natural position where it should be and not up on a wedge? So I look for shoes that don't have a high heel and a low toe. So the heel to toe drop, we want that to be low so that we get that full natural um, extension, if you will, that heel down to the ground, nice Achilles stretch, let the muscles do their job. The next thing we also want to look for are, uh, and if you look on the inside of the shoe, some are designed to have a lot of arch support and posting in there. Some are very rigid and control the midfoot motion. So if you go into a shoe store and you pick up a shoe and you can wrench it pretty easily and there's not a lot of stuffing in there, your foot is probably gonna be working a little bit harder to control the motion and it's doing its job. But if you go in there and it's a really fat shoe and you're having a tough time twisting it and it's really stiff in the middle, that changes how your foot is transmitting force from when you hit the ground to rolling off on the heel and then up through the body. It's going to change what your body is doing. And shoes that do that um, are more likely to cause problems than not. And so we look at shoes that have a little bit of flexibility to them, that the inside of the shoe should be uh, really free of a lot of the materials that provide a lot of art support, stuffing in there, air cells, gimmicky things. We, We don't need that. We just need a shoe that has a nice resilient bottom to it, pretty flexible, kind of looks like this mm-hmm. style. So the, for people who can't quite see it, it's a shoe that's got a very evenly, an even height from the heel to the toe, a nice wide toe box that's shaped like a foot um, instead of very narrow or pointed. A shoe should not feel tight or really snug on your foot. You should be able to fully wiggle your toes and splay them. So that way, when your foot hits the ground, the foot can do its job and splay the toes and create that tress or support so it can bounce back and give you that energy as you step and bounce off. Don't let the shoe do the work. Let your foot and all the structures of the foot do it. What can happen over, yeah, so what can happen over time is the more shoe you put on your body, the less uh, you're going to be able to feel the ground underneath your foot, and you're not going to be able to react as well, and you might fall into mechanics that are a little less favorable, which means knee dive, pelvic drop, foot aversion, all those things we don't want. So a shoe that's a little bit thinner, you can feel the ground a little bit more readily, you can respond and interact with the ground a little bit more healthy. I hope I explained that okay. Perfectly. Yeah. And I think that's a very, a very diplomatic answer because it avoids, you know, people want to know what brand should I buy? And all of these brands have shoes that fall into the category of the shoe you're describing, something that's flexible, low heel to toe drop. Regarding that, do you, is there a particular number that you want or maybe just as low as possible? Because I know there are, you know, some shoes that are 30, you know, uh, what is it in millimeters, maybe 30 millimeter drops. Some are, you know, 10 or less. Yeah, so there's 30, so when you see the really, really big number, that's usually the heel or the stack height. 
So that's usually like, if it's really high, it's in the mid thirties, mm -hmm. that's like a pillow. Um, when we talk about heel to toe drop, a big drop is like 10 to 12 millimeters. That's pretty big. That puts your foot in a wedge position. Then there's the moderate, which is like the six to eight. And then there's the lower or the minimal, which we like to define as more zero to four. People you know, have different definitions of that, but really operationally, we want it to be as low as possible. We want the foot to feel like when you hit the ground, it feels natural. That's what we're looking for. Um, and technically, if you have anything that's over an inch in height, that's actually considered a high heel. Mm -hmm. So for those folks who are running in shoes that have heels over an inch, you're running in high heels, which is a very different mechanic than a nice flat foot that has a different a feel to it. Yeah, uh, no doubt. And you can definitely feel it in wearing the different shoes. I mean, you can certainly feel when a, a, it's putting you in a weird or compromised position. Yes. And so the one thing I do want to caution people about too, is that I don't want you to hear this and think, oh shoot, I have a, a 12 millimeter drop. I got to get rid of those and run out and go buy a zero. Transition, please transition. And so what I mean by that is take the next few months to go ahead and maybe do a shoe that has a moderate heel to toe drop. And then a few months after that, then graduate to something that's the minimal. And the reason we do that is that you're gonna be using completely different muscles, including those on the posterior part of your kinetic chain, your glutes, your hamstrings, your calf muscles, even your foot muscles are gonna be used intrinsically differently and you're gonna get sore. And we don't wanna cause injury as you're trying to make a favorable change from one thing, just don't go too quickly. So that period of time would usually mean introducing the new shoe around the house for about a month. Don't even run in it. So put on the new shoe, get used to wearing it, and then introduce the shoe maybe uh, in one run a week. And then the next week, maybe two runs. And then that slow transition. And then finally, you've made the full from one type to another. And then you can go from a moderate to a low. And that really helps people get their strength up, allows the bones and the tissues to adapt so you don't get into this, this overload injury issue. I think that's I think that's great advice. And anybody who has tried to do barefoot running after not doing barefoot running ever for a long period of time knows that you know the next day yeah. you wake up and your your calves are <laughs> nice yeah. and tight. So definitely go into go into these and implement that slowly. Um, any actually, I'll save this for the listener question. I was going to ask a little bit about barefoot shoes, but somebody had a question about that, so we can maybe uh, discuss that. But um, yeah, I appreciate that advice. I think again. One of the main things that people ask about and struggle with is deciding on what pair of shoes to wear. So there are so many different brands out there. And I think if they follow the strategies that you just recommended, I think that can be a perfect way to select something that's going to keep you uh, injury free. Yes. I, um, each year, we actually try and go through the new ones that are coming out and go through all the criteria. Are they meeting generally what we would want to look for? So that way, when runners come in, they're not still just trying to wing it and figure it out on their own. We provide different brands with the models that fit that. So if you're a Saucony person or you're a Nike person or this, we try and get something for all different brands. Um, if it meets it, give it a go and see, see how that works. If you don't like a particular kind, try out a few. So it's always helpful to have a few different kinds in the background that you can mix and match, change up. It's good to mix up the shoes a little bit. That's perfectly okay. But just don't jump from a really high drop to a low drop. So stay within the same category, if that makes sense. Yes, awesome. Makes perfect sense. Okay, so I'd like to end on some, some listener questions. Look like we have about six or seven here. They were all, again, all great questions. I was, I was happy with, uh, with the responses that we, that we got over Twitter. So the first one here uh, comes from Steve O, 1962. So he says, we, some of these we may have covered as well, but uh, he says, I was a heel striker. Any tips on switching to forefoot slash midfoot striking? Which group has the lowest amount of injuries? I think I'm pretty much midfoot, but I haven't videotaped myself. Yes. Fantastic question. And so the one thing I also want to mention is that when it comes to foot strike, uh, I know this can be confusing. And if you pick up any given study, it's very particular to that context of the study. So what I think is emerging, and there was a nice systematic review that came out that basically um, kind of inferred the importance of the softness of the landing, maybe a little bit less emphasis on the strike and more on the softness. So even if you're a uh, I'll, I'll make this up. It's rare, but if you're a heel striker and you can land softly, that's a good place to start. But invariably, when you try and do the retraining and the cueing, when you try and land softly, most of the times, naturally, you're going to start to get off the heel. 
Why? Because you're starting to lift the knees a little bit more, use muscles that you haven't in the past. And when you land softly, you invariably shorten up your steps. So if you're trying to make that switch, a really good technique is to use the soft landing. There's no right or wrong here on how you learn to do it because each of us has a slightly different strat motor strategy. Just a little bit of a lift. Imagine in your head, and I use these cues with Brady as well, that if you also ride a bike, it's that pedaling motion. Imagine what that's like to keep your feet relatively close together. A nice short shuffle at first to be soft, and you're never going to hit the heel on the pedal when you're bike riding. It's always going to be off the heel. You could try that. You can also use a metronome. So having, a, if you have access to a treadmill or if you like to run outside with your phone, just use a metronome and make yourself purposely go fast, over fast, just to get the feel of what it's like to use your feet softly. And then you can lower the cadence a little bit and get into something that's a little bit more natural. You can try that out and see if that helps you get off your heels a little bit and then have somebody film you from the side a few times. Did you get the hang of it? So those would be the moving into that realm to see what that feels like. Great. So the next question here is from Michael. He asks, how can you do a self-analysis on gait and form? So many people could benefit from correcting small issues. Yeah, uh, video is powerful. It's mm -hmm. very powerful. You just have to know what to look for. And so that's part of what I hope is to bringing the science to all of you is that these sophisticated analysis are great, but what if you don't have access to it? So the phone style uh, feedback is really good. And for those people that have uh, smart TVs and you can hook your phone directly to your smart TV, that's a great way to kind of see if you can do that. But it also means you might have, that, have to have access to a treadmill. <laughs> if that doesn't work either, you can also take this outside, take it on the road and have a partner film you as you're doing your um, uh, the, a back and forth jog of whether or not you're achieving the type of format that we're talking about here today. Yeah, and it is very, I've done that multiple times just to kind of like see myself in it. It can be very helpful just using your iPhone alone to get that just okay. visual feedback and, you know, maybe compare it to some of the things that we talked about today with my form. Compare it to my form, it's likely much better. <laughs> yeah. So next question uh, comes from Adrian. He says, barefoot running training seemed to be a big deal a number of years ago. Is there any truth in the data to this? So I guess truth in the data, meaning, you know, is there any kind of evidence or uh, beneficial effects of barefoot running? <laughs> So what I would say is any motion that encourages you to intrinsically use your muscles to the fullest, that's going to be good as long as you make that appropriate transition. And what I mean by this, if you want to do barefoot running, all the more power to you. That's what our bodies were designed to do. We have our, our feet with these multiple structures and ligaments and muscles. Let them do it. But if you're going to make that transition, it's going to take a period of months to get your feet stronger first and then be able to start transitioning from the running part. Um, if you want to intersperse barefoot running as part of a training program, um, I'm not as familiar with the literature on, on that part in terms of safety or injury. Um, I can see theoretically why that could be valuable. I just have to know the parameters of what you would consider to, to be using as part of that training itself. But yeah, anytime you can get your body using itself to the fullest is always a good thing. Yeah, because I just think often with the barefoot running debate, it's almost an either or thing. They're like, oh, people yeah. shouldn't wear shoes at all, or you need to wear, you yeah. know, definitely shoes. But I think it can be implemented as part of training. And that's kind of something that I, I tried to do as well. So, uh, yeah, I think it, there, went, there was a phase where barefoot running seemed to be, you know, the holy grail. And everybody was thinking that we're never going to wear shoes again. But I'm glad things yeah. have sort of <laughs> moderated a little bit and come yeah. back to, on that And spectrum. you know what? You could always, you know, you could always move in the direction of not full barefoot because, you know, it's hard running out on the road. You don't know what you're going to encounter. But you could do a minimalist shoe, which really has just the rubberized bottom on it. It's really just designed to protect your foot from the elements. Mm -hmm. That's it. So you could, you could try that. That, but again, make that appropriate shoe transition and please do foot strengthening exercise for a period of weeks first before start using those as, as uh, training shoes and transition the training shoes as well. If somebody's interested, I can provide them that process of, of how to do that if you want to do that. Great, great. And um, yeah, lots of brands with sort of those very, very thin sold out there. So you don't yeah. want to be stepping on a glass or a nail or something right. out there. No fun. If you can do yeah. it on grass or turf, that's definitely ideal, but not everybody, you know, has access to that for sure. Right. 
So uh, another question from Joey. Uh, we already covered this a little bit, but he asks, is it true that the 170 to 180 cadence is ideal regardless of age, gender, pace, height, weight, running level, et cetera? I'm 5'8", 160 pounds, and not an elite runner. My comfortable pace is eight minutes per mile, but 170 steps per minute is so hard for me. Yes, and, and we acknowledge that. And so hopefully I gave some description about that a little bit earlier. Yes. And remember, this is a this is a process. So I don't know what the um, what your original or your comfortable. Did he say what his comfortable cadence is? Um, he didn't say what his cadence, his comfortable cadence was. But, you know, maybe we'll assume somewhere 160, 165, maybe mid 160s. Yeah, he didn't mention okay. what it was, though, unfortunately. Okay. So, you know, just what you can try over a period of weeks is just the slow creep. So maybe try the cadence if you're naturally at a 160. The next time, try it at 162. Go for a week or two, see what that feels like. The next week, try 164. So that way it's not such an overwhelming jump from one to the other and see what that feels like to your body as well as you make these adjustments and allow your body to get stronger with that. So I know nothing about your history, Joey, but hopefully that gives a little bit of ways you can kind of sneak that along and see if that works for you or feels better. Great. And then just two more questions here. So yeah. Thomas asks, uh, are there any suggestions for a framework for selecting the right running shoes, relevance of compensating shoes for people that overpronate or supinate? Is it best to just run neutral or is compensation necessary? We kind of already covered that, but if you want to maybe add a little bit to that, we can. Um, you know, we talked yeah. about finding a flexible shoe, but. Yes, I do. I, I think I may have tried it to tweet an answer to it as well. I'm not sure if yes, that went through. So. <laughs> but, but I think I, I did see that, yep. Okay, good. But I, I do want to explain just a little bit on that is that anytime you look at a shoe that does motion control, you're changing the rest of your running motion. So even though it's a shoe that sits on your foot, once you start tinkering with how your foot is moving, those forces when you hit the ground have to go somewhere. So if it's a foot that prevents uh, pronation, that means now you're going to overload on the outside of your foot and start making your forces go out to the sides of your body, which can often lead to compensatory knee pain or otherwise. We've seen that a lot. So people did okay with the shoe they had. They went to the shoe store and said, oh, you overpronate. They give you this pronation, you know, anti-pronation shoe with inserts and now they develop pain. So if you're feeling good, don't fix what isn't broke. Go ahead and just stick with the neutral shoe. Same thing with, with supination. Very rarely in our tenure here have we ever had to say, you really should get a motion shoe. Mm. Neutral really works fine. You just got to have to get your body stronger. Even for people that have the what are called the pes planus foot or the flat foot, only once have we had to use specific orthotics for that particular person because of the severity. The rest have done really, really well with strong foot strengthening, therapy and doing therapy without shoes. So really working on that intrinsic strength and a neutral shoe works quite, yeah. quite well. Yeah, well, that, that's very interesting. And especially to hear that coming from someone like you, I think people can trust that, you know, they don't need these heavy motion controlled shoes and that they can really just train their muscles to become stronger. I think that is really uh, an important thing to note. So I'm glad we, yeah. we went into a little more detail on that yeah. for sure. And final question here from Matt, um, kind of a general statement, but any suggestions geared around injury prevention as we age and any recommendations specifically maybe for battling hip soreness or tightness? Okay. So again, <laughs> not, not knowing anything about your history, it's a great question. Just because you age, it doesn't mean you can't keep running. What it does mean is that you're going to have to start listening to your body a little bit more. So part of the challenges for our runners who transition from uh, younger age to middle age to middle age to older is that they still want to do the same volume that they used to be doing before at the same speeds and they keep getting injured. The successful runners that have longevity that might have aches or pains or even osteoarthritis or nagging issues are very successful if they tighter back on the volume a little bit of running, take up interval running instead, and or replace running with some of the other types of cardiovascular exercise that you might really enjoy and incorporate purposeful strengthening. So I know that might not be what you wanna hear if you're a runner, it, but what it's telling you is that you can hang on to the running for longer if you incorporate cross training, the, the overall body strengthening, especially for lower body, which, which means focus on single leg activities as well as two leg, not machines, but those things that involve dumbbells, 
free weights and coordinated neuromotor control. Those are gonna be really important for you. And just continue with mobility types of exercise. So the big stretching through the hip, the multi-joint, like the pigeon stretches, hamstring stretches, you wanna make sure you're really getting those hips, um, maintaining that mobility as well. Yeah, I think the volume thing will resonate with many because you know it's it's impossible to keep up the same volume you, you yeah. did forever, but there can there can certainly be replacements. You can do the same weekly, say, hours of exercise. It might just not all be able to be running. That's something I've had to come to terms with as well in the past few years, and I yeah. wouldn't consider myself aged. So, you know, it's just yeah. uh, learn to learn to adapt and, and enjoy yeah. new things, I think is an important thing to know. Yes, exactly. All right. Well, you know, I appreciate you ask, answering all those questions. Um, listener yeah. Q&As aren't something I do on every podcast, but like, again, like I said, people seem to be very interested in this topic. So I think they'll be happy. Those questions that we answered, the, those who asked them will should be uh, hopefully delighted that you took some time right. to answer them. And I really appreciate that. Um, all right. Well, Dr. Vincent, I, I had a great time talking to you. I think this was a very informative podcast, not only for me, but I think people learning how to uh, run healthier, run stronger, I think they're going to learn so much from this podcast. And so if people want to find more about you and your work or follow you on social media, can you just quickly plug where they're able to do that? Sure. So look for us in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. Sometimes it has the acronym PMR. So if you look up Heather Vincent, UF PMR, hopefully that should come up on Google. Uh, Twitter uh, is uh, the uh, capital UF underscore SPC. So since I manage that account, that's where the communication comes in. Um, and then I'm trying to think if there's anywhere else we want to do that. Those usually fall under those two, two things. Yep. And any, any of the links that you mentioned or anything else that I can find will include in the show notes so people can click Perfect. on those easily. They won't have to do the work to, to Google and find out where to go. So we'll have all of that uh, information. But once again, Dr. Vincent, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast and um, have a great rest of the day. Thank you so much. It was a privilege. Thank you, Brady. Thanks. Thank you, listeners. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for listening. And I'll see you next time. Bye. Okay, bye.